this is like the early days of the auto industry. There are going to be a lot of people that don't make it. Uh, our forecast is four to five people that are here today, very, very credible players, have teams, have great backer, backing, you know, financial backing, et cetera, and are building the right thing. Um, you know, four or five of those were survived. There's going to be a lot of carnage. Welcome in to Business Air TV. I'm your host, Kaylee Nix, here once again with Preston Holland. Preston, we've got a really exciting, kind of a special episode of Business Air TV because, as we mentioned, to kick this off, you were at the NBAA conference down in Orlando, and there was so much incredible content down there. We just had to keep it rolling. I was in the studio for 16 Woo! total hours doing interviews with incredible guests. We aired three one-hour segments. Mm -hmm. We had the content turned around for anybody who's ever done content. Most of our content was turned around in less than 20 hours. Just incredible props. So by the time that we finished the interview, it was 20 hours until that actually mm -hmm. hit the air. We did that three times. That included first looks at the G700, at the Deso Falcon 6X, uh, and our production team was absolutely incredible. They crushed it. And so because we had 16 hours of content <laughs> and we only have a one hour block here, had to, had to save a couple for, uh, for this show. But it's awesome because we have some absolutely top tier interviews to share with you today that were just mind blowing when it comes to the future of business aviation, right? Yeah, I think one of the most impactful conversations that I had while I was at NBAA was actually with Gary Geisen. He's the CEO of WISC. We talked about consolidation in the EV tall market. Mm -hmm. There is billions and billions of dollars going into this market. It's what all of venture capital is putting all of their money to work in aviation. And we talked about what happens next from a funding and mergers acquisitions, acquisitions perspective, so. So you're gonna to get to see a little bit of that interview today. Preston, I wanna dig into your experience at NBAA. So the exciting thing about the Business Air TV stage, it was right there next to the main stage of what was going on, right? You got to hear some awesome keynote speeches. You got to interact with all the folks who were there at the conference. What was your favorite keynote speech? So Neil deGrasse Tyson spent a couple, he spent about 30 minutes just absolutely blowing the audience's <laughs> mind when he started talking about deep space and uh, terrestrial life and the way that, you know, some of the light was refracting mm. and, and things like that. It was, it was absolutely mind blowing. I mean, you gotta love having Dale Earnhardt Jr. though. I mean, do it for Dale. Okay. Uh, that was a great, that was a great talk too, but all the speakers were fantastic. The stage was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. There's LED walls everywhere and we were right next to it. So as our guests left the keynotes, they came straight over and they sat down and talked to us. And so I got to talk to, you know, executives from Airbus corporate jet all the way to Jetit, a couple of fractional uh, companies and, you know, really got to explore what is happening in, in business aviation and also what's happening in the business of aviation mm -hmm. because businesses transact every day. There's yeah. flight schools, there's mergers and acquisitions, there's fundraising. So, you know, we got all of that stuff. That's what this show's about. Got so much content that we've got to jump into it today. So you guys got existential with Neil deGrasse Tyson. You got excited with Dale Earnhardt Jr. And now we're going to get into some of that stuff that we just could not leave out of our coverage of NBAA. So let's go ahead and get into that first interview, Preston. Who do we have up first? First up, we have got Glenn Gonzalez, who is the co-founder and CEO of Jetit, talking about their next airframe purchase, why they purchased that for their mission, and what the growth for Jetit looks like going forward. All right, let's dig into that interview right now. Welcome back to Business Air TV. Today we're exploring ownership options, and I have the privilege of sitting with Glenn Gonzalez, who is the CEO and co-founder of Jetit. Glenn, thanks for coming on. Preston, my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. So give me a little bit of background about Jetit. Why, why did you start this business? Where do you come from? And, uh, and where, where are you seeing yourself go in the future? Yeah, so Preston, look, I've only been in aviation. Uh, I flew fighters in the Air Force. I transitioned to, from that to flying Gulf Streams around the world. I love the sales aspect of what I was doing at Gulfstream and uh, started selling Honda jets. And in selling those Honda jets, recognized, man, there's a huge gap in the market. There's a huge need for this airplane. People are flying two and a half hours 
Uh, they're flying three passengers on board and what airplane better to do that with than the Honda Jet. And so we created our days based model with Jetit. Uh, we're service minded, service focused, safety minded, ser safety focused. Um, and here we are. So let's explore one of the things that we're talking about today is all of the wide variety of ways to leverage private aviation and the different ownership options. So let's talk about how the actual mechanisms of the Jetit membership works. So you're a fractional based company, is that correct? That's correct. So we, can you explain to me the mechanics of a fractional jet service? Yeah, so uh, fractional means you're buying a piece of the airplane. Instead of buying 100% of the aircraft, uh, we, we parse it out into tenths, uh, one quarter of the airplane, a fifth of the airplane, um, and then from there, you get the airplane a number of days annually. Traditional fractionals are just on an hourly basis. You get a number of hours per uh, share size, depending on your share size. And then you have a monthly expense as well. So there's the acquisition, there's a monthly expense, and then there's an hourly expense uh, for your utilization. In our case, it's days, but you're only paying for the hours that you're on the airplane. Whether you're going somewhere for recreation for an hour, um, and, and only flying for an hour, or you've got multiple legs in a day uh, for your business. Uh, it's, there's a great and distinct advantage to our program. So let's, let's double click on the cost function. So you pay some sort of price up front. Approximately how much is it right now to buy a fraction of one of your aircraft? Yeah, so you know, we, we have uh, announced, and there was a, a great Forbes article by Doug Gollin, widely known from the industry with private jet card comparisons. Um, and he put together an article about Jetit and our introduction of a new platform. We presently hon operate Honda Jets um, and Gulfstream G150s, and now we're adding the uh, Phenom, the Embraer Phenom 300. Tremendous airplane, uh, wonderfully reliable, and our customers have been asking for more capability. So walk me through why the Phenom 300, is it, it's a step up from the Honda Jet. What type of profile does the Phenom 300 fit? Yeah, so it, it is for our same customer base. Um, it, it just gives us a little more range. You know, we, we built the uh, business model on the bell curve. 66.67% of the people are flying less than two hours and have less than four people on board. Great airplane, but if we can expand that to 75, 80% by having an airplane like a Phenom 300, then it, it makes great business sense for us to do that. There's also the, the diversity of fleet. Um, if a Honda Jet is down for maintenance for whatever reason, or the Embraer is down for maintenance, then we have another platform in the middle of our Gulf Streams and our, our Honda Jets. So you buy into the aircraft, so let's say somebody was going to buy into one of the Phenom 300s. They're going to pay a lump sum up front for as little as one-tenth of that aircraft, correct? That's correct. So it's under a million dollars for a tenth of the airplane. Um, that's going to afford you 25 days a year. We've got to have some room for maintenance on the aircraft. We've got to have some room for feeding Jetit. Um, that we can offset your cost of ownership, uh, flying for only $2,300, excuse me, $2,400 an hour for a Phenom 300. It's a remarkable uh, price point for that much airplane. So it's 50% more expensive, but you've got 50% more seats. You've got 50% more range as well. So it's a great fit between our Gulfstreams and our Honda Jets. So you pay, you pay up front and you can depreciate that actual purchase because you're actually buying the underlying asset. It's not like a jet card where you're buying time, you're actually buying the actual asset. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, it, it is a business tool. So the business owner that ha needs to write something off this year um, might consider a fractional versus you know just buying time on a jet. Is, is that kind of what you're seeing is kind of your profile? It, it's a very big deal and we're, we're hoping that uh, it doesn't change. Um, a lot of people do take advantage of 100% depreciation. You can take a really good year and buy a share with Jetit or buy a whole aircraft and make it a great year by not having to pay taxes on that you know just under a million dollars uh, that you earn that year. We all work so hard, especially in this current environment with all of the supply chain challenges. Um, why not take advantage of uh, some of these things that are 
helpful to our entire industry. It creates more jobs uh, in the manufacturing space. It creates more jobs at companies like Jetta. We're over 200 people now in our very short tenure of operation. Um, it creates jobs with the FBOs and the fueling, and um, it creates more tax revenue in other places. So it, it's been very good for our industry, but it's also great for our economy. Where can somebody, if they want to find out more information on figuring out does fractional make sense for my business, where should they go to find that information? Yeah, there's a, a wealth of resources out there. Obviously, you can come to us, gojetit.com. We're happy to engage with you. We'll consult with you. If we're not the right fit, you'll know it and we'll tell you directly that. We don't want to waste our time or yours uh, with um, the, the wrong solution. Uh, it's our job to keep people happy, and that's one of the tenets of our business. Very cool. Well, Glenn Gonzalez, thanks so much for coming on Business Air TV, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Preston, thank you for your time. Awesome, thanks. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Business Air TV. I'm here with Stuart Illiam from Blue Tail, who's going to talk to us about digitizing uh, electronic aircraft records and digital transformation. Stuart, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me, Preston. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, so so give me a little bit of your background in aviation. Tell, tell me about where you come from. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the reader, Reader's Digest version because it is quite long, as, as you already know. So I uh, started out uh, uh, with aspirations of becoming a pilot, uh, trained uh, uh, at UND in North Dakota uh, in the 80s, got my commercial instrument uh, licenses and ultimately decided that I love the business side of aviation more. So uh, transferred to Ohio State where I graduated with a, an aviation minor uh, and an accounting degree. Worked for Deloitte out of school, TWA was a client, so I got to see a little bit of the commercial airline world. Found my way out to the Bay Area where eventually uh, kind of a roundabout way uh, wound up in the tech world. So I went, uh, spent about uh, eight years at Apple Computer at the time now called Apple. And uh, I bring that up because A, it was a great experience, but B, uh, I met my, my, my co-founder, Roberto Guerreri at Apple. He helped hire me, actually. So got to really enjoy that uh, for a number of years. Did the whole dot-com thing for a couple years, if you recall that. Uh, and then ultimately got back into aviation in 2003. I bought a flight school in Southern California doing in-aircraft type ratings called Flight Crew Systems, now called Loft. They're a 142 training organization ultimately sold my interest in that company and worked my way over to another company called ProFlight with Caleb Taylor, helped build that up. They were also doing um, basically 142 simulator training uh, that was eventually purchased by uh, Textron, became True Simulation Plus Training, and uh, left that and then you know, was looking for uh, my next great venture and found my, myself in Arizona. Uh, and reconnected with my own my old partner, and we just thought it was kind of fortuitous, and we started Blue Tail. Yeah, so so let, let's let's dive into what Blue Tail does. What, sure. What's what's your mission? What do you what are you guys trying to accomplish? You know, it's 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 a very I, I would call it kind of a, you know um, I guess simple mission that um, you know we realized you know long ago as we were talking about this idea that. You know, it's one of those ironies of aviation that you've got a $60 million airplane, but you still got $20 worth of paper supporting that airplane, that being the log books and all the supporting records. So, um, you know, we founded Blue Tail with a very simple premise of digitizing all those aircraft records. So, not just the log books, you know, your airframe, your, your, your power plant, your APU and your props and all that, but it's all the other supporting records, all the supporting maintenance records, which will typically sit in bankers' boxes today, you know, in on bookshelves and, and in file folders, that sort of thing. So, basically, we founded the company to digitize all those records, to protect those records, to digitize those records, put them in the cloud, a cloud-based application, make those records searchable and shareable. Um, and you know, that was basically the core mission, just to protect those records, because it's a, probably you know a, a little-known secret that. Uh, you can't insure aircraft logbooks, so it starts with that premise, and that was basically the founding principle of the company. It's become much more since then, which we'll talk about, but that was just basic, the basic idea. And I guess the other part I would mention, too, is that we built uh, a professional services arm, a scanning arm, to scan all those records, because you can't do the application unless you get everything digitized. So we built a, a network of 120 um, locations in North America where you can drop off your records, get them scanned, and more recently in the last six months, 
we announced basically a crowdsource model where somebody can actually come to your facility and scan those logbooks on site because they are very valuable. Not everybody wants to send them out. So, so we've got kind of two models, uh, two businesses, but, but yeah, that's the basics of Blue Tail. Is there any regulation on actually doing the scanning themselves? Does the FAA regulate that process? You know, there, uh, there is some guidance under Part 43, which covers, you know, you know, logbook entries and reproduction, that sort of thing. You know, you, you basically need to certify that they're originals and that you didn't alter them. I think that's 43.12. Hopefully I remember that correctly. <laughs> uh, not, not, not to be uh, referenced to for legal yeah, advice. No, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> thank, thank you for the disclaimer. I appreciate that. But, uh, but now that would be one way. And then, you know, you could certainly take, uh, you know, we, our currency is always bankers boxes. So maybe you have Maybe you've got a 20-year vintage aircraft, you've got 20 bankers boxes. So you could certainly take that to one of those 120 locations and we could have a courier come by. And you know, when I mention a scanning location, this is a, a, what we call like a SOC 2 compliant location that is, is typically scanning like high-end documents like legal, financial, insurance kind of documents, medical records, that sort of thing. So this, so, is, a, this is a professional scanning. Very this is, professional. This is not hiring uh, somebody's not nephew all. as an intern you know, to you, scan you my You could drive pages. by the location not even know it's a scanning facility. There's cameras everywhere, there's chain of custody, inventory procedures and all that. So you could drop them off uh, and certainly do that, You know, sign all the forms. We could have a, a bonded courier come pick it up. Um, so that's that's the second way of doing it. Uh, the third way would be this, this network that we launched that I mentioned, this crowdsource network. So we've got somebody that'll go into your hangar, they'll show up, uh, sometimes it's two people. We bring in a full kit, like a little Pelican case with two scanners. We've got a, a sheet scanner, an overhead scanner. And this is this primarily uh, 91 operators, 135 operators, or is it individual GA, is, even, is it even applicable in GA? Y you know, it's funny, so when we launch Blue Tail, and, and you know, you always have some assumptions when you launch a business, right? Some of them are right. <laughs> Some They're usually wrong. wrong. They're usually wrong. <laughs> but we got some right. Uh, you know, we really thought that I think our service was going to be more applicable, at least initially, to the owner-operator segment. That's the world I came from, the training world. But, you know, we quickly found that, that there was a lot of corporate flight departments and, nine, and 135 operators that loved the idea of digitizing their records, putting them in the cloud, protecting them, and doing all these amazing use cases. So. Um, so it, it really runs the gambit, you know, of, of everybody, you know, that, that would use the system, that are using our system. We've got everything from a Cessna 172 up to an, A3, an A340 an a in our system today. It's, it's really designed to handle all of that. So you're digitizing records, which means that you have a large amount of data on these aircraft. Um, how are you thinking about systematizing that data and then potentially monetizing that data on the back end? Yeah, so, you know, with we, we thought about like kind of a data play when we started the company and I think, you know, we, our, our initial focus, and this is where we are today, it's all been about getting the records digitized, getting them protected because, you know, heaven forbid something should happen, whether it's a natural disaster or a theft or misplacing records, because we've heard, everybody's heard horror stories of missing 8130s or 337s and that, that could ground an airplane. So, um, you know, it's founded on that principle um, and as we've built the company, it's all cloud-based, and, and this is where, you know, me coming back on the technical side, I've just been amazed at the tools that have been available through the cloud to do things like digitization, to do things like, uh, you know, so we've got like a search, we've got something called mock search where I can scan a, a, a 300 page binder, right? And then, you know, within five minutes, that whole binder is instantly searchable. So you've taken 300 images and made them searchable through you know, optical character recognition. So, the, so the, even the images are searchable? The images are searchable and it's all done through the cloud. It's all done automatically. Typically, you know, in the old days, you would, you would enable OCR through the scanner, but now it's all done uh, through you know, just the system that when you upload, it's automatically OCR'd. So every last character is searchable. So you can find paint codes, part numbers, forms. I mean, we've built, and I think that was your original question, We've built a lot of machine learning and automation in the system to automatically make that searchable, to pull out all those forms, and that's been a basis for like this new conformity product that we just launched. We couldn't have done it without doing that part first, and, we, and we're doing it really well. You know, I remember when ForeFlight came on the scene, and you know, 
One minute everybody's carrying around paper charts, right, into the cockpit. Next thing you know, everybody's using iPads, and it's like, when did that happen? It's like a switch was flipped, and we see that inflection point coming sooner than later, and we're starting to just see, you know, just, I mean, we're growing by leaps and bounds, and we're hearing more people talk about it, and we're having a conversation today, so I think, you know, I can't tell you exactly when it, it happens, but I think sometime in the next few years, there will be this inflection point where, you know, everybody that's been thinking about digitization will, will get on the train and get serious about it, because it is something to do. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, the payback for doing it, I mean, all the different reasons, it, it makes perfect sense. And Well, Stuart, thanks so much for coming on, and Thank I appreciate you for having it. Where me. can people find more information about Blue Tail? Bluetail.arrow. Bluetail.arrow. Yeah, A-E-R-O. Awesome. So, Thanks, yeah. Stuart, so much. We appreciate it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Business Air TV. I'm Preston Holland. I'm joined by CEO of WISC, Gary Geisen, here at MBAA in Orlando, Florida. Gary, thanks for coming on. Sure. So, Gary, I want to talk about um, eVTOL and commercialization specifically. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of capital that's gone into this space, uh, and there's announcements indicating commercial activity, but it's it's often future promises sure. and future booked revenue. Um, when do you think that we are finally going to actually start transacting in this market at scale? Yeah, well, at scale, I'll, I'll answer the first part. You know, when and then and then at scale is a different thing. So, in, I mean, there's some companies that have said 2024. I think that's a little sporty. I think you'll see the first piloted EV tolls in 2025. That that's my guess. And, and it'll start very defined, very specific routes um, in certain cities, you know, before it starts to expand. I, I think part of the part of the thing, and this gets to the commercialization, is you know how accessible is it? What does it cost? Right? And and so you know, and how do you get to true scale? What problem are you solving? Where? And is it a big enough problem where you've got a lot of demand for that route or multiple routes? And then, but how do you get to a mass market and really have this thing scale? And I, I think that's a little bit further down the road. I mean, we're taking a little different approach. We're going straight to self-flying. So there's no pilot in the cockpit. There's no controls. The pilots are on the ground. So WISC is not having the conversation that everybody across the country is having right now with how are we going to staff these aircraft with more pilots? We are not. Yeah, we do not have that problem at all. And it, in fact, it's an awesome one, but it's also it's job growth. So you'll get, you know, uh, pilot unions and others that will say, oh, geez, you're going to take our jobs. No, no, we won't. These are short hop, 10 to 20 minute flights. And, and the type of people that will be supervising our flights are like drone operators, air traffic control type people. You don't have to actually be a, a certified pilot to manage our fleet. And so it's, it's also a job creation. Uh, capability, but back to you know the reason we're going self-flying. One of the reasons, safety is a big one, but the second one is price point. If we don't have a pilot, you don't have the pilot training costs. You don't have everything else. You're not taking a revenue seat uh, out of the aircraft. Our operating costs are lower, and we're all electric, so operating costs are lower. Um, our target is to charge three dollars per passenger mile, and so if you do the math on that, that's like taking an Uber X. Not an Uber Black, you know, an Uber X, and so and compare compare that to uh, a fuel-powered helicopter right now in New York City. Oh what's, God! What's yeah, a what's a passenger mile cost right now? Ten to fifteen. Okay, so we're talking significantly oh, lower. Oh yeah, so dramatic difference. Actually, making it accessible for the right. college kid, not necessarily right. the right. you know C-suite executive that right. flies helicopters. Right. That's the whole thing because the hel helicopter market is, you know, a very small and narrow market. It's a very premium service. That is absolutely not what we want to do. And it's why we're going straight to the self-flying stage. And so so when does that scale? You know, our our modeling, our business plan by 2035, we think we will have moved 300 million passengers. So if you put that in context to just general and commercial aviation, it's orders of magnitude change. So when you think about moving people at scale, um, you, have to, you have to get public adoption. Mm -hmm. it, and if, if you've ever been in a small airplane or brought, even more interesting, brought a family member or relative into a small airplane, it's a, it's a tense experience. Yep. Um, 
what about you know public sentiment? What what are you what are you guys doing to try? What are you guys thinking about as far as actual public adoption? Because sure. you can put it in front of them, you can make it affordable, and frankly, there's so much venture capital that you can subsidize the actual transaction cost for a long time while people get yeah for a period of time. But you have to run a business, right? You have to do something that that makes money eventually, right? Yeah. So we've been through, uh, we've traveled around to different cities. Uh, we've had 650 people go through and actually sit in our cabin, tell us what they like about, tell us what they wanted in terms of comfort. So especially with us, without having a pilot, you know, all, 93% of all commercial aviation pilot functions are already automated. It's already automated. So it's the comfort of having somebody there they can talk to. Great. So uh, we've got a screen for every seat, and it's four seat. You can hit, you know, I want to talk to somebody now, talk to them directly on your headphones. There's a help button. You know, if the cabin wants to talk, hey, what's, what's happening? There, the screen tells you your flight route, how long is left in your flight, when you're going to bank, all those kind of things, so that you, we're creating this environment, and it's roomy. So it's not like some of the general aviation aircrafts that are super tight. And I think that makes a whole difference. In addition to educating, like, why this is safer, why is this going to be the safest form of aviation? So for those uh, in our audience that are pilots, very familiar with the FAA, sure. very familiar with uh, all the good things that they do and all of the roadblocks that they sure. tend to put up, what are you seeing right now um, from a regulatory standpoint? Uh, you know, we're approaching a lot of interesting things happening in the next 18 months. Um, what are you seeing from a regulatory standpoint that you know, excites you and maybe some things that might make you a little nervous? So what, what excites me is, I think, from Administrator Nolan, Billy Nolan on down, they have a vision of pushing this forward, advancing this agenda, making it happen, resourcing it. And so uh, he's got the right mindset, and I think his team has the right mindset to embrace this. I mean, technology changes happen fast, and things get disrupted. You think of the Tesla Roadster introduced in 2008, and Every major automobile manufacturer is building an electric vehicle now, 14 years later. Uh, Uber ride sharing started in 2010. 12 years later, it's no big deal to you know, book your ride uh, on your phone. Who would have thought you know, back in the day? So this technology, you know, back to your earlier point, billions of dollars that are going into this industry, it, this is happening. This is absolutely happening now. The challenge, the frustrating part is we're getting outspent in this area by China and Europe. They're spending more money on AAM than the U.S. is. And so the dialogue we're having with Congress, the dialogue we're having with the administrator and his team is how do we change that game? Because we can't be underspending the rest of the folks that are doing AM. So right now, America is not in the dominant position in the AAM market. Correct. How do you think that that gets solved? Funding. I think it starts with Congress. And you know we've got a reauthorization bill coming up in 23, and that's the start of it. But and also setting a target. So what you know we talked about some dates earlier, but you know 2024, or 2025, or whatever. But what's the actual real target where we think this is really going to go? And then let's work backwards from that and figure out what are all the things that we need to do to demonstrate to the FAA the safety uh, of these vehicles and operations. And so that's the, actually that's a conversation I just came from. Very cool. Let's shift gears for our final topic, consolidation. Mm -hmm. This market will have to see consolidation at yep. some point to really reach viability. Um, if you had a crystal ball, one, when do you think consolidation happens? And two, how many major players do you think actually yep. come out from all of this? It's a great question. So there, are, people have different numbers in terms of the total number of people that are in this space, 200, 300, 400, it's absolutely crazy. It takes uh, several billion dollars it takes to build, launch a new aircraft, whether it's and piloted then, or unpiloted. And then after the billions of dollars, you still have to build the thing, and you sure. actually have to exercise the manufacturing muscle And then after you, that. you have to make some money so you can keep going, all that, right? You need the right team, you need to build the right thing, you need to get it certified, you need to be able to produce it, and you need to be able to make a business out of it. So uh, there is going to be, this is like the early days of the auto industry. There are gonna be a lot of people that don't make it. Uh, our forecast is four to five people that are here today, very, very credible players, have teams, have great backer, backing, you know, financial backing, et cetera, and are building the right thing. Um, you know, four or five of those were five. There's going to be a lot of carnage. 
there are going to be a lot of companies that don't make it. And so it's already started. So there are some companies that have already closed operations. Is um, there opportunity when those companies start to wind down, does it make more sense to go pick up the pieces afterwards, or does it make sense to buy them before they hit the, ba hit the bottom for you as a CEO? Yeah, so I, I think it's a third option, which is neither the first two and the people. So we are, we're scaling like crazy. And um, in this market, which is kind of interesting, everybody has a little bit different configuration. And, and they so, all look similar. They're all, it's, it's all cousins of some Yeah, sort. yeah, yeah. But, but they're different. Right. And different approaches to it and all that. So do you need the IP from that? Maybe there's something. Um, do you want to buy them outright? Probably not. But do you want the awesome aerospace engineering talent? Absolutely. Well, this has been a really great conversation around business and the actual business of EV Tall. Um, thanks so much for coming on. Do you have any any other announcements or anything that you'd like yeah, to share with us no, before? No other announcements else today. Gets? There's there's more <laughs> stuff coming, but not today. <laughs> it's true. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Gary. Thanks for coming on. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Business Air TV. We're here at MBAA in Orlando, Florida, right next to the Innovation Zone. And speaking of innovation, I'm here with Eric Cote, the president of Jaunt Air Mobility out of Canada. Thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. So I want to understand uh, how the regulatory environment, how you guys have been able to navigate and uh, transact inside of aviation, both in the U.S., Canada, and abroad. What, what type of what type of hurdles are you facing right now? So we're still in the early days, uh, but you know, specifically in our case, as we will be certifying uh, for Part 29, which is you know the IAS level on the rotorcraft uh, certification. I think that we've put aside some of the challenges that we may hear about from the eVTOL community uh, so far. Uh, one way also for us to mitigate it a little bit is that, you know, what we've seen so far, and, and you know, I think that I may be, you know, not necessarily right about it, but we can feel like there is a lot of pressure on the FAA right now the, by the fact that there are so many people uh, making inquiries and going to the same, uh, you know, uh, area of expertise at the FAA that for us going uh, for a, a certification in Canada with Transport Canada is going to be an enabler. So talk us through where are you in the process right now? Where, where is Jaunt Air Mobility at in the certification process um, on your current airframe and, and how many other iterations of airframes do you guys plan to bring to market in the next few years? Yeah. We have a, a, a demonstrator aircraft that flew uh, 300 hours uh, that was, you know, we were allowed to fly it with a pilot, but we are still in the uh, really early stage of converting that existing aircraft to a full electric aircraft, having, you know, latest and greatest technologies like uh, fly-by wires and using all of the, you know, the new available technology. So how far are you from true commercialization? You know, if we look at the, the work we've done in the past eight to ten years, we actually bought the IP from a previous company, Carter Aviation. So uh, all the work they did, you know, we we're piggyback, big, piggybacking it on it. So the, the 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 data that we've had to translate it into a new aircraft will allow us to go straight from not a. We won't go for a prototype, then a pre-production. We will go straight to. We will have a, an aircraft in between, you know, a full-scale model, then go to the pre-production aircraft. We will certify that pre-production aircraft and commercialize it. What we see right now is a lot of, you know, aircraft flying, but if you look carefully, these are all unmanned. Uh, so I would consider them as what we did with our, you know, uh, grounded aircraft that we have right now. So they are still in that process. So sometimes you may feel like it's tomorrow, but it's not, you know. Uh, we, we think that, you know, the first commercial flight will happen in 2026, 2027, which is the date that we maintain since the beginning. So timeline is five years to kind of clarify. You're thinking five years before commercial viability. Is that, do you find that in the entire eVTOL market or do you think that that is just for your business? Do you think there's somebody else that's going to get to market faster than five years from yeah, now? Yeah, we think that it's a little bit optimistic 
to go and certify and commercialize with dates that we hear like as early as 2025. Uh, because as of today, you know, you need to have certified systems. Even if you've got an aircraft ready, you need to have the motor certified, you need to have the avionics, you need to have all of that certified for aviation, which is also something that takes time. We think that, you know, within the next few years, some components will be almost on the shelf. So electric motor will eventually become like a commodity. So at that time, yes, I think the rest will evolve pretty fast. But until we get, you know, the major system certified uh, or ready to be uh, used for uh, aviation, I think that this will be a challenge. Social acceptability, I think that we will go through that. Uh, as long as we've got good players around the table, which I think we have right now, the uh, ecosystem is, 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 is good. There's a lot of money flowing on the market. Uh, a lot of learning also is happening. So it's, it's good for everybody. Uh, but we don't think that we will, we think, we still think that we will be among the first being in early 27. And do you think that making the move to Canada is going to give you a distinct advantage over some of your competitors? I have to say yes. I think that, uh, and we see every, every, almost every two weeks, we see a new engineering uh, company coming to Canada and to Montreal uh, in the eVTOL market. So I think that they see that there's a, there's, a, there's a pool of talent there, a lot of expertise, a lot of available infrastructures also. So do you have, is, is there a core of skilled talent in Canada that exists now in the eVTOL market? Or are you having to retrain some of that labor pool? No, definitely we need to retrain. Uh, but as this is, I would say, a sexy new segment of market, a lot of interest into it. The new, you know, young engineers uh, are really looking into that. And one differentiator that we have in Quebec is that we also have all that electrification of transport cluster, which you don't have in uh, Seattle, which you don't have in Toulouse in France, but we do have it in Canada. Going from the minerals that you would find in the, you know, in the ground to make full battery pack up to delivering aircraft. So we have all of that in the same, and honestly in the same physical location, you know, in the province of Quebec. So this brings a lot of tier one and tier two suppliers to be al already existing and evolving to that new um, market. Yeah, absolutely. Shifting gears just a little bit, a lot of our audience uh, is in the capital allocation space and is looking at making their next bet uh, on one of these companies. How do you see, there, a lot of companies are spacking and going public and you know, aviation is uh, arguably over-indexed for some of that fundraising activity. How are you guys thinking about increasing your runway to get to that commercial viability. Um, do you need to raise money? Is that something that's going to be on the table for you? Do you have any plans to go public? Yes, definitely that, you know, we've seen the SPAC craziness a year and a half ago. So a lot of companies went from one day to the other, like fully funded. Um, we, we didn't consider the SPAC version of it, uh, funding, uh, but going, you know, for some other uh, sources, we're looking, we're still looking for, you know, uh, for partners. We are still at the at the stage where we can we still have some flexibility to get some uh, equity in the company. So this is definitely some an area you know. Uh, but we want to have good partners. We want have we don't want to have people that will put money into it and have high expectation. This is at the end. This is it looks like automotive, but it's it's a aircraft business. You know, it takes time. So you don't have a return within two years, three years. So it's a long term investment. And if we find the right partners, we still have room for that. Definitely, this is... It is arguably speculative as well, right? There is a lot of unknowns. The FAA could decide, no, we're not going to allow you to certify, and that five-year return window now becomes a 10-year return window. Yes. And I, I wonder if the market actually prices that in when you talk about fundraising. Yeah, this is, we think that we are a safer bet because of our Part 29 certification, which is using something that exists uh, and you know, we didn't talk about it, but on the safety uh, side of it, this is also where, you know, some, some designs uh, are questionable. Some of them are pretty good, but still have to. But if I talk for our own, you know, we have full auto rotation capabilities. We have a fixed wing on top of that. So at the end of the day, this is probably safer than a helicopter and safer than an aircraft. 
So that will put more chances on our side, making less speculative. Uh, but some other designs which are new, if they have no way of being able to control or if they lose full power on the aircraft, uh, using a ballistic parachute uh, may be a challenge. So in the eyes of the investors, that is something that we think some of them may not have considered yet. You know, I fly helicopters and sometimes I'm afraid that, you know, something may happen. But in, with that specific design, the fact that, you know, we have a main rotor, but we also have a fixed wing. If I lose the main rotor, I can still glide, you know, and if I lose the wing, I can still auto-rotate. So in, in that sense, some of the model, you know, I can make my iPhone fly. If I put a motor on it, it will fly. But if I get rid of it, if I lose power, I'm done. So I need some alternative. So until we get that under control, because a lot of, there is a lot of resistance on the market right now because people would not want to install a ballistic parachute because of the weight. It, and so if you install the parachute, all the, the um, equipment related to it, you will probably have one or two passengers less that you can carry. Which also impacts that commercial viability part Absolutely. that we talked about earlier. Absolutely. You cannot make it uh, an economical uh, business case if you only fly two passengers at a time. So you know that the brake even point is at least you need to have four. You, you mentioned earlier that you are a helicopter pilot. What's the most unique place you've flown your helicopter in? Oh, up north in Canada, going yeah. fishing in the remote areas. And this is, uh, you know, you can land, it's uh, freedom. So if you had to advocate for more people owning their own personal helicopter, uh, what would you tell them? Don't come to Canada because I won't be alone. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, this has been great. Thanks so much for coming on the program. And very I nice really day. appreciate it. Best of luck in the future and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. We'll be right back from Business Air TV at NBAA. Welcome back to Business Air TV. We're here at NBAA in Orlando, Florida. I'm here with Craig Pickin, who is the managing partner of North Star Executive Search. Craig, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So Craig, I want to talk about how you got into the search function. How did you start this company? How did you get into executive recruiting? Tell us a little bit about your background. So my background was, uh, was a Naval Flight Officer. Okay. So I was a backseater in the Navy for eight years. And then when I left the Navy, um, I landed a, a role of Gulfstream aircraft and spent four years with Gulfstream and then moved over to Bombardier business aircraft. Okay. So about eight years with uh, Gulfstream and Bombardier combined. I left the industry for a little while and uh, just went off and, and did some real estate development with a, with a large company. And uh, from there, I missed aviation. And interestingly enough, a guy that I used to hire to train my sales teams at the Greenbrier said, you'd be a really good executive recruiter. And yeah, literally, that's how I became an executive recruiter. And it was, you know, I had the now, I, I, you know, I understand aviation. The industry was, uh, you know, it's been a, a lifelong passion of mine. Uh, I knew the people. Um, you know, I've run the PL. So uh, it, was a good, it was a good fit. That's, that happened 15 years ago. That transition happened 15 years ago. So tell the audience, maybe somebody who is wanting, they have a goal to reach the C suite in a mid-market aviation business. What are the key indicators that make somebody qualified or a, a good fit for one of those positions? Yeah, look, and, and this is where what I tell the young kids coming up now, and I mentor a lot of college kids. Uh, it started out at University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where I've, 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 you know, they've got a great mentoring program, but it's expanded out to young executives around the industry. And what I tell them early is, you know, you got to make an impact early, you know, so, you know, as I like to say, just become the guy or the girl. So you may be in that junior role starting your career, but in that junior role, make an impact. You know, make yourself known to your boss, make yourself known to your company. The projects you take on, make sure they're delivered on time and flawless, and you'll make an impact, you know, slowly but surely or rapidly, your career will, you will grow. Yeah, that's great, that's great advice. And kind of staying on that trend, um, are you seeing business aviation at the executive level reach outside of aviation, or is it mostly recruiting away from other companies, maybe smaller companies, maybe adjacent companies inside of aviation? Yeah, I think that um, the times are starting to change where we really need to find 
impacting people from other industries and start looking at not industry knowledge, but skills that people bring to the table. Um, can, you, can you talk about a couple of those skills? What do, what do you think business aviation lacks at the executive well, level? Well, uh, yeah, for instance, I've, I've, what is it? It's 11 o'clock in the morning here today. I've already had conversations about, three conversations about finance executives. Yeah, strong financial skills. People who understand how to run, read a balance sheet. People who understand how to read you know, or, or how to manage a, a P&L. You know, your, your, your charter management companies, sometimes they start to look at industry experience and how to run you know, airplanes and manage airplanes and things like that. But I'm all about, hey, we can teach people the industry. It's easier to teach really good people the industry than it is to teach industry people how to be necessarily really good. So let's shift it just a little bit. Let's talk about trends that you're seeing uh, people talk about at the executive level. Level. What is the number one thing that you're hearing executives talk about, whether it's industry trend or it's direction? Right? We have EV tall, we have electric propulsion, and that gets a lot of press. What are you seeing inside of some of those closed doors? One, one word, people. Everybody's like people. And here's the reality of the situation. The employment shortage is structural. What people are seeing today you know, there is a deficit of people. When you think about a 3.5% unemployment rate, we are at max employment. And that is structural. The shortages are not going away. And so you think about, you know, A&P mechanics, the things the industry needs. A&P mechanics, everybody is struggling for A&P mechanics. You think about pilots. Everybody's, Everybody's struggling, for, struggling pilots. for pilots. You think about, you know, people who understand how to run businesses. All right, where and how are we gonna get the people? Uh, everything else is a sidebar to that conversation. So how does aviation solve that problem? Look, I think it starts with the, it starts with the OEMs. It's gotta start with the OEMs because they have the biggest vested interest. If they wanna sell airplanes, you have to have support. They have to have support. Right. People have to, they have to have pilots, they have to have, you know, mechanics. If they want their aircraft to stay in the air, right. there is people that have to keep them in the air. And, and if they want to sell new aircraft, those planes yeah. need to move more hours and yeah. reach the end of their life cycle so that they can yeah. churn out the fleet. And people, are, you know, like Gulfstream has got, you know, they've got, I think it was Savannah Tech, they've got a program down in Georgia. They, 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 they got on top of it early. You know, I know uh, on the commercial airline side, AAR out of Chicago is really pushing hard to grow their own, you know, they're, to, you know, they're partnering up to get A&P mechanics. The thing that's starting to scare me though is, here's where the dichotomy is coming into play, and I don't exactly know the answer, but there's a big push for technology in the cockpit where you know, companies are saying, well, we can remove the pilot. Well, when you start to think about we can remove the pilot, why would any kid in his right mind go invest in a $150, career, $150,000 in a career to become a pilot? Right. So we need to change that dynamic to say, wait a minute, you know, we need these, we need pilots. They are highly capable professionals that need to be recruited, attracted. I don't, you know, we need them in our stables for our industry to grow. And I think the, one of the issues that we have is you have these companies that are pushing the envelope on autonomous flight. Right. And while that would be important at scale for urban air mobility and advanced air mobility at the scale that they say that it's going to happen, because we don't have pilots, I don't know if that necessarily translates into reality across the next 10, 15, 20 years. But that, that doesn't mean that there's not a, a narrative problem inside of inside of aviation, so I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's the, the narrative there has to change. And look, uh, you know, business aviation is a great career. Um, you know, it's, you, you talk about the equipment is amazing, the, the service and support is amazing, the FBOs are amazing, the industry is incredible. And when you go to trade shows, you get to walk around and look at big airplanes. You get I mean, to walk it around. Does, it really doesn't get much better than that. That's exactly, that's exactly it. I mean, we've got an amazing industry, but now we need to protect it. And right. we need to be uh, you know, into the universities, talking about 
you know, new levels of technology development in aircraft. We need to be in the trade schools and showing people, hey, look, you know, uh, an AMP working on a 21st century jet engine is a highly valued skill. And we need to be pounding that message out there and make the industry as exciting to these, you know, the next generation as it really is. And you think about, you know, from an industry standpoint, you know, you know, a lot of people are saying, I want to go be a software engineer, and they, and they say Apple, or they say Google, or they, you know, great companies. But you take a Honeywell, or Rockwell Collins, or Garmin, or some of the smaller companies that are doing you know, enhanced vision, you know, HUDs, you know, amazing cockpits, which today you know, nobody could dream of 20 years ago. The advancement of technology inside of aviation, I think, doesn't get nearly enough uh, press or you, yes, the the EV tall is cool and it's very very interesting. There's so many other things that happen in existing flying certified aircraft. It just doesn't get as much love. What's happening with jet engines? You know, now they everybody wants cleaner jet engines. And you know, it's interesting if you talk to Richard Ab Abalafia, um, one of the better known analysts in the industry. He, he brought up an interesting point. He goes, "We have achieved over the last 50 years a one percent reduction in emissions per year." So 50% over the last 50 years. Well, now you think about jet engines are, you know, the next evolution of jet engine won't be evolutionary, it'll be revolutionary. You know, what does that look like? Is it, you know, revolutionary ceramics? Well, you go to Purdue University and you go, what engineer wants to go work on, you know, you know and, and they'll all raise their hands and they'll say, hey, this is great. You know, it's a, it's a revolutionary version of the jet engine and I helped create it. Um, you know, I think it's exciting. Aviation is alive and well, and we need to tell that story for the world to hear. And that, that story needs to be told yeah. every day very loudly. Absolutely. Well, Craig, it's been so great being able to have you here on Business Air TV. Thanks for stopping by the booth here at NBAA. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap on that final coverage from the NBAA conference. So many incredible conversations were had. I'm honestly really jealous that I wasn't there to get to listen to all of these, but I can find them up on flyingmag.com. Yeah, they're on flyingmag.com slash business air on demand. It's our over the top video player. We're working with groups to get that distributed out across the country. Share it with your friends, share it with your coworkers. Let them know all of this awesome stuff that's going on in business aviation. I think that last conversation that mm. we had with Craig was super impactful because it's really talking about this next generation of leaders that's coming up through business aviation. You know, uh, NBAA 40 Under 40 is a great representation of that. And there's all of these, all of these new leaders coming up mm -hmm. through business aviation. That thought leadership and development of the next generation is absolutely crucial, right? When you think about reaching down and extending hands from people who are existing executives and trying to mentor and really nourish that next generation, what do you think is the biggest task on hand for these ex existing executives to make sure that that next generation is ready to go? One of the things I think is identifying those groups of people that um, are in organizations early, mm -hmm. right? There's this av geek group that grew up flying maybe with their grandpa or grandma and, or, or their mom or dad, and they love aviation. You don't have to teach that. Right. But it's actually teaching the business skills, right? Everybody has to, you know, everybody has to turn a profit, has to have a sustainable business model. And as we talk about sustaining business aviation, which is a huge theme from MBAA this year, sustaining business aviation means investing in the next generation bringing up that level of executives so that business aviation can continue to thrive. Mm -hmm. It's not just about propulsion, not just about sustainable aviation fuel, not just about electric. It's also about sustaining the, env the environment of business aviation. That is so crucial and I'm so glad that you brought it up because I think that gets lost a lot when you talk about ESG goals, right? It's all about, okay, how do we physically meet these ESG goals? But at the end of the day, 
you have to have people to do it and you have to bring up that next generation with you or you lose your talent pool. Right, absolutely. And you have to teach them the business skills. Mm -hmm. They have to know how to read a profit and loss, a cash flow statement. They have to understand what is a cap table, what is raising money, what is distribu distributions to investors, what is strategic planning. All of those things are super important. There's a lot of companies leading the way. Uh, you know, Grant Boyd, who is uh, a contributor at Flying Magazine, works at Textron. He's an MBAA 40 under 40. And those are the skills that he's learning. He's told me that, you know, he's been able to, you know, they've been, they've been really advancing his career and teaching him the things that he needs to know to be an executive. Incredible stuff there going on. And of course, for any interview that you want to catch on demand, you can head on over to flyingmag.com. Go give us a follow on social media at Flying Magazine on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, all of the above. You can find all of that content there and more. Preston, where can folks go to find you on social media? To find me, Preston Holland 6. I'm most active on Twitter, so give me a follow. I'll follow you back. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at KayleeNixWX. Always appreciate a good airplane pick. Always appreciate a good sunset pick. Bonus points if they're together. You will get probably a like, a retweet, and a follow out of me. Man. I can't beat that. <laughs> I might beat that. I might reply. There we go. There, okay, all that. right. Selfishly plugging both of our social media. Well, Preston, great to have you back again to recap our your NBAA experience. We'll be back live next week in the studio to cover the business of aviation. Don't go away. Of course, head on over to flyingmag.com for all of your headlines needs. Subscribe to your newsletters. Go ahead and watch our content, and we will see you next week at 1230 on Thursday.